Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. This, I think, is going to be the last Watchman, e no, not ever, on the subject of what we've been referring to as the wafer Christ. You remember the priest who holds up? In some cases, it's about like this. But if the church really wants to be flashy and showy, and it's some big, high-ranking person, well, it's like this big around. They, how do you get all that into your mouth? Anyway. But anyway, this we're, we're going to try to finish it up with this. And I would say that some of the things, I'm going to go ahead and tell you now, some of the things that I will discuss in this Watchman broadcast will, will be rated PG. In other words, you parents will have to decide whether or not to let your children watch a part of this because there's something in relation to the Eucharist, the priest's robes, a room called the sacristy, and some very evil things that have taken place there. If you don't already know what I'm talking about, I'll explain it to you in a little bit. Let's get into our scripture, Matthew chapter 24, verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Let's put our picture up on the screen. The priest says, here is Christ. Jesus said, that's not me. I'm not flat. I'm not like that. You can't, that you can't pretend that's me because it's not me. And so he goes on to say, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall shew great signs and wonders. We're going to see some of those today. Great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect, the truly elect is what it means. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Lightning travels pretty fast, doesn't it? Whether it's coming straight down or back up, um, or it's going across the sky, you can literally watch it go across the sky, but it's very fast. We don't have an airplane, to my knowledge, that can travel as fast as lightning can travel across the sky. It's just absolutely amazing. So anyway, as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And for those of you who are on the fence straddling it, which, number one, that's got to hurt, right? Number two, you can't decide whose side you want to be on. I mean, part of you, your spirit says, join Christ. Join his army. Be on his side. Your flesh says, what Christ? There's no Christ. There's no Bible that God wrote. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. That was what Aleister Crowley came up with. But there is a Christ, but he tells us, don't just believe everybody who says, oh, here's Christ, here's Christ. And he said, there's going to be many false Christ and many shall follow them. If there are false Christs, then there's going to be false apostles that go along with it. Remember here a while back, I mentioned uh, Dr. David O'War, the false prophet of Kenya. And buddy, did we get some backlash on that one? And you know what? That was sort of a badge of honor for me. Now, I wish and pray that the guys who came by our radio station to complain about whatever preacher that was they had on their radio station that was preaching against Catholicism, and they need to take that guy out. And our poor radio station staff said, uh, we can't take him out. 
he owns the station. It's his station. That made him angry. And then, of course, the Catholic Church. They've done all kinds of things to us. They've tried to bribe us, tried to run us out of our own property. I don't think they're done yet. But I do believe at some point they may very well end up being our persecutors. Because as Paul said in the book of Galatians, just as uh, Hagar and Ishmael, who were born under bondage, despised Sarah and Isaac, who were born free, and persecuted them, and Abraham had to send Sarah and her son out into the wilderness and say, get on out of here. We stand in these days with everybody that's lost mocking us, making fun of, uh, fun of us, calling us names, making threats to us. But that should not stop us, number one, from loving them. Number two, trying to share the gospel with them to lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because after all, they're not born again. Even by their own doctrinal standards, they're not born again. And they can, that's one thing about being a Catholic, is that from day to day, you never know from day to day, whether or not you're going to heaven, if you died that day, you never know it. When if you read the, the letter that John wrote called 1 John, if you read all of those chapters, you'll walk away knowing beyond any doubt that you're saved or possibly that you're not saved. So I would just encourage you to read more of the Bible and then read it. When I say these things last couple of weeks and I'm saying them tonight, when I say these things, instead of you getting angry with me, accusing me of preaching blasphemy, uh, uh, being a heretic and uh, he should be excommunicated. Well, I was never incommunicated. We need to get rid of this guy. If you would just stop, get a King James Bible and compare what I said with what your popes, your councils, your nuns, and everybody else has said about the way for Christ, you'll find out that number one, the things that I said about what Catholics say are true. Number two, you'll find that the Bible contradicts almost all of their doctrines, or we could put it the other way. Almost all of their doctrines contradict the word of God. And the Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed? And the obvious answer is, of course, no, they can't. Um, then, 2 Corinthians 11. And this is a great analogy of this, what we're going to talk about. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And so remember, if it's another Jesus, it is bound and determined to be another gospel, and they will bring with them a different spirit. See, the Holy Spirit of God will never testify in favor of false doctrine. He never will. All God has to do is release devils to go and deceive people because they're just, they're just in heaven going, boy, I, my hand's just itching to go and deceive somebody. I wish I could deceive somebody right now. God says, you really want the job? Because I got some people over here. They don't believe a word I said. Why don't you go what, what, make up something? What are you going to make up? You know what? I'll convince them that by eating different things, they can go to heaven. God says, great idea. Why don't you go down and do that? Because they don't believe in the cross. They do not believe in Christ's power through his blood. So therefore, why don't you just lie to them, convince them of some other doctrine? Because I guarantee you they're going to believe it. 
That's exactly what Micaiah, in essence, said to Ahab that he saw concerning the dream about trying to get Ahab to go to battle the next day because God had it all set up that an arrow or a spear was going to come flying through the air randomly and just happen to jab into King Ahab. And when they went to wash the blood out of Ahab's chariot, it just happened to have been the exact place where the dogs ate up the blood and the body of Naboth, who owned the vineyard, who Jezebel and Ahab had killed. And God said, the dogs are going to lick up your blood where Naboth's blood was shed. God, God knows everything. He knows everything. So, Paul says, For I fear but lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. And so, here's that picture again. And in this picture... It contains the core of what the Catholic Church is all about. They actually believe that this wheat wafer, by the power given by God to an earthly priest, has the ability to take wheat and water that's been patty-caked together, baked in an oven, set out for people, a prayer of blessing is prayed, you make your hands do this, and then alakazam, hocus pocus, now the wafer is the literal blood and flesh of Jesus Christ. And in eating that, you are partaking of God, you are receiving Jesus. So they use some of the same lingo we do. Have you, have you found Jesus? Yeah, I found him. The priest gave him to me last week. Put him right on the end of my tongue. So if you're going to use, you know, jargon and lingo like that, you're never going to win with these people. That's why I tell you, if you're going to witness to them, quote scripture. Quote scripture. Because they've had these doctrines twisted so much, they think they believe it, but they don't. So here in this picture, not only is there, are they saying, Here's Jesus, and it's not Jesus. If you eat this, you will be saved, but that's not the gospel. And if you eat that and are saved, you will receive the Holy Spirit, but that's not how you receive the Holy Spirit. Do you receive the Holy Spirit by drinking something or by eating something? No, the Bible never says that. The Bible tells us that the Holy Ghost, Paul mentioned it. He said uh, in Galatians chapter 3, received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. And they went, well, now that you think about it, yeah, we, we received the Holy Ghost because we heard your sermons and we believed them and the Holy Ghost fell on us. We all spoke in tongues. We all know it. So what do you know, guys? Peter was right. And Paul was right. We don't have to keep the law in order to receive the gift and the blessing of the Holy Spirit. So that's why I say, if you have a different Jesus, it automatically is going to be a different gospel and it's going to be a different spirit. Now, this idea of transubstantiation Substance is in the word transubstantiation. The substance of what was wheat and water, that substance upon the words in hoc corpus meum est hocus pocus, when the priest says those words and does this with his hands, poof. Now your whole, now he has Jesus' literal flesh in his hand. 
My friends, that ends up being more than just a doctrine. It ends up being a superstition, a supernatural superstition. But it's a superstition nonetheless, and it's one that is not anywhere backed up by the Word of God. So, I found some more articles to explain the Catholic idea of what receiving and partaking of communion, you know, us Baptists and everybody else, we've had communion before. At our church, ever since I was a little boy, we washed feet afterwards. I love that. I love washing saints' feet. The men get side one room, ladies in another, for obvious reasons. We teach our children that. And it's been a joy for me all those years to wash the disciples' feet. Jesus told us to do it. So I don't know why some churches don't do it, but Jesus told us to do it. So we have that doctrine where we wash the saints' feet and we can point to certain places in Scripture that tells us to do that. And the Catholic Church now has a doctrine that says if you want to be saved and you want to go to heaven, you must eat God. You must eat God. That's what they're saying. Who is Christ? He is Son of God. He's the Son of Man. But is He God? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John said, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, the Word being Jesus, and these three are one. So they're all one together. And it, this, this idea goes way back before the Catholic Church. But we're going to read from uh, EOTH.info. It's a Catholic website on transubstantiation and the doctrines and the meanings behind the Catholic Church and some of the rituals that they do. Here is what they say about eating God. The origin of Catholic practice of transubstantiation is an inherited version of the ancient Egyptian ritual of making the Osiris cakes. Stop right here. Remember who Osiris was? He's the sun god. Rises in the east, goes down in the west, just like Jesus, the son of righteousness, arising with healing in his wings. The heavens are the tabernacle that Jesus abides in. You see that? So they've replaced Jesus with Osiris, their sun god. So it says, uh, the origin of transubstantiation, an inherited version of the ancient Egyptian ritual of making the Osiris cakes, also known as sacramental bread. Bread made being symbolic of the reborn or regrown god Osiris which took place during the annual 30-day Koyak Festival. Each day of the Koyak Festival involved one of the steps of the process of making corn mummies. Hang on a second. Uh, let's go back to this picture of the Eucharist. Do you see an image there on that Eucharist? Yeah. And who is it? Well, it's not Jesus, but it's supposed to be Jesus. You're being led to think this is Christ. Here is Christ. So the Koyak festival, the bakers made corn mummies. And it says, two days after the death of the God on, on the 17th of Athir, the priest brought forth a sacred chest. Now we're talking about ancient Egypt. We're not talking about modern Roman Catholicism. But as you're going to see here, the Roman Catholics 
and the archbishops and the bishops and the cardinals and the pope didn't just dream this up one day. These were things that had been done for thousands of years before the idea of Catholicism ever came up in a secret meeting somewhere. So two days after the death of the God on the 17th of Athir, the priest brought forth a sacred chest which contained an image of Osiris. When this was revealed to the worshipers, they saw in it their resurrected God. In the temple at Dendera were found a series of inscriptions which describe how cakes of divine bread, look at that phrase, cakes of divine bread were made from the body of Osiris. These were the mysterious sacred cakes which Plutarch calls the inward parts of the God and which were in fact the Eucharistic bread. We see therefore that the publicly performed passion drama depicted the earthly career of Osiris, but the secret ceremonials were Eucharistic rituals, symbolizing the transmutation of Osiris into the grain and of the communicant into an Osiris. Here's what this means. They made these cakes out of probably cornmeal. They baked them in, and they were to resemble Osiris. Osiris is the dying God. Why? Because Osiris is the sun. He rises up in the east. He's being born. He's the most high God at noon. But then he falls and he dies. He goes down below the, the, um, the horizon. And now there's no light. It looks like Osiris is dead. And they believe that he went into the underworld. And lo and behold, six o'clock the next morning, he's resurrected all over again. Halle Sirius. Or something like that. Praise Osiris. What a wonderful God he is. He's been resurrected now. That's what they believed. But it wasn't Osiris that caused the sun going down and caused the sun to rise back up again. It wasn't even Satan's idea. It was God's idea to show us that, number one, God is a God of newness. God is a God of new life. And whatever mistakes you made yesterday, today's a day that, that can be better for you. Today's a day where you can start trying to clean up some of that mess. Today's a day where you can be restored. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. And if the Lord tarries his coming, which I would never count on that. I would never say, yeah, I am. I'm, I'm convinced. I am 100% convinced I'm going to be a Christian one of these days. I want you to do it now. Um, well, see, I got invited to a, a poker game. And I'm pretty good at poker. And I know I'm going to clean these guys out. But what I'll do is I'll take part of my winnings and I'll give it to God. God says, keep your money. I don't want anything to do with it. You keep it. Maybe if you're still around by the next day. And you yield yourself over to me. Then you can hand over whatever you want to hand over. Or keep it all. I don't care. But some people to this day use that as an excuse. Just like they did with Osiris. Um, they talked about it. They called it cakes of divine bread. And the idea was that when you eat something that is divine... And it goes into your body. Your body temporarily becomes a divine being. Just like God is. And people, that's a lie. And we know it's a lie. And I think a lot of people know that that's a lie, but they do it anyway. Uh, from the same website, eating the God, we call it. 
The doctrine of transubstantiation does not date back to the Last Supper, as is supposed. Like many of the beliefs and rites of Romanism, transubstantiation was first practiced by pagan religions. In Egypt, priests would consecrate mest cakes, M-E-S-T, which were supposed to be uh, which were supposed to become the flesh of Osiris. The idea of transubstantiation was also characteristic of the religion of Mithra, whose sacraments of cakes and heoma, a drink closely parallel the Catholic Eucharistic rite in Roman religion, it was a controverted topic for many centuries before officially becoming an article of faith, which means that it is essential to salvation according to the Roman Catholic Church. Now they refer to us, the Catholic Church, they they finally figured out that they could probably do themselves a, a, a greater thing, they could build up more Catholics in this world if they just stopped brutally killing all of the Christians. If they stop dragging preachers and deacons and church members with a Bible in their hand or people holding a Bible study, if the Nazi Gestapo stopped bringing people out, shooting them in the street way because they were in there having a Bible study, if they stop doing that, then maybe people would start having a favorable idea and concept of the Catholic Church. But here they are, you know, the Jesuits, They've got to have their terror organization, and that's what the Jesuits are. We're going to drag these people out in the street. We're going to ruin them. We're going to have them killed. And oh, yes, they've done it many times. I don't have time to get into that today. Um, it was a controverted topic for many centuries before officially becoming an article of faith, which means that it is essential to salvation according to the Roman Catholic Church. In other words, if you do not partake of their Eucharist, not yours, not something you bought. I remember as a young boy, um, really too young to know what the communion was all about. But I thought it was neat in church. We get this little plastic cup and we got, I guess the church didn't really know how to make unleavened bread or nobody did. So they used unsalted crackers, broke them up. That, that was just as good. They're unleavened. And everybody got a little piece of cracker and we ate and we drank this and we ate that. And then one night, me and a buddy of mine, it was his idea, I promise. It wasn't my idea. He always got me in trouble. Brother James Weimar, brother, I love you. I can't wait to see you in heaven. He caught me and this guy drinking the leftover grape juice that was left in the tray that nobody drank. Oh, he got mad at us. Oh, my God. And, and I never did that again. Trust me. Never did that again. But according to the Catholic Church, if you don't believe that this is the body and blood of Christ, and therefore you don't partake of the Eucharist, you cannot receive the graces that God would have given you, the forgiveness of your sins, regeneration, so on and so on. Heaven, you get none of that. You're doomed to hell if you don't do that we had years ago in our church when i was a teenager our church ran a daycare for a while my mom had a little bit of daycare experience so the pastor tapped her to be the daycare director and some ladies in the church worked in the daycare and there was a couple of twin girls, real pretty girls, about five years old. And they had an older brother who was about 12. And they lived on a small farm outside of the city of Festus. And they were out in the field. Their, doctor, their dad had used his tractor to push over 
uh, trees that he had cut down to push over the stumps. So the stumps would, you know, stop getting nourishment from the ground and dry out. It would be easier to get them, get rid of them then. And the older brother and one of those twin girls was playing under that root wad of that stump. And all of a sudden the stump went over like that and killed them both. And they were Catholic. And that Catholic priest looked at the mother who now only has one child and and one of the twins and to her face said I'm sorry ma'am but your daughter is in hell because she was not baptized as an infant that's wicked That's wicked to tell that grieving mother that her innocent child has no hope and is burning in hell now forever. That's wicked. Uh, Let's keep reading. The ritual eating of cornbread resenting the body of Osiris and the drinking of the beer or wine representative of Osiris conceptualized as the God who taught Egyptians to make barley and wine in short became rewritten into the story of the last supper and the eating and drinking of the body and blood of Jesus Christ and the concept of transubstantiation. In other words, they're telling you that it wasn't the devil foreseeing the future that people would be partaking of the Lord's Supper and then said, well, we'll do it now and we'll pull everybody away with the fake stuff before the real stuff ever shows up. No. They wanted them to believe that Christianity stole that idea from the Egyptian pagans. And that's not how it happens. And I can tell you... um, Jehovah's Witness do this, Mormons do this, um, all kinds of different groups. They will accuse the true Bible-believing Christians of simply regurgitating ancient pagan practices to pretend that they're having church and they're serving God, but they're really not because we know the truth. We know there is no hell. We know the truth that there is no hell. Nobody has to suffer for for eternity. And and there's nothing bad that happens to you once you die other than you're going to lay in the grave and wish, oh, I wish I could see Jesus. Oh, I feel so bad now. That's not punishment. But that's the lie that they tell. And that's what it is. So the ritual of eating cornbread representing the body of Osiris Um became rewritten into the story of the Last Supper and the eating and drinking of the body and blood of Jesus Christ and the concept of transubstantiation. By eating the God in the form of the Eucharist, in a type of communion in leavened cakes, Osiris' divinity and immortality became that of the worshiper and a spiritual communion through becoming one with their God-man. The sacred ritual of Osiris consisted primarily in the celebration of a Eucharistic rite in which the advocate and the followers of Osiris eat the flesh of their God in the form of the wheat cakes and drink of his blood in the form of barley ale or beer. Which some of you are going, Boy, if that's how that church did it, I'd go there every Sunday and tell you that right now. (laughs) That's what they want you to believe. That instead of the devil preconceiving what little he knew about what God was going to do in the future, set up a substitute religious system to replace it. So that by the time Jesus comes on the scene and he gives them the pure doctrine, which involves being born again and involves 
a sacrifice. It involves a baptism of some kind. It involves um, a communion service, eating this food and drinking this drink. And when you do, I mean, think about it. If if this Osiris, corn Osiris, it reminds me of the, the uh, gingerbread man. The gingerbread man. When they make the Osiris cake, it looks like the form of a man. And they got these people convinced that if they were eating that, they were literally eating God. And that by eating God, they would become God. But that is a lie. It's a blasphemous lie, is what it is. It is, who said it? Peter? A damnable lie. Meaning that the doctrine itself is damned, and those who believe it are damned as well. Because they believe that over what they read in the scriptures, if they even read the scriptures. And I guarantee you, I've been in church almost all my life, and I know how some people are. If you could convince them with a new religion that they could receive this religion by a one-time act and that they never had to read a holy book of any kind. They never had to receive some sort of ritual done on them. They never had to attend a local congregational service. If you could convince people of that and that they could keep all of their old sins and still be saved, you could, you could lead billions to Jesus Christ. You could lead practically everybody to Jesus Christ if that's how it was. But that's not how it is. And here we are saying, if any man says, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Now, I came across this today. Just, I just added this. I mentioned to you the Council of Trent. And the Council of Trent sat down to sort of formalize the rules, the doctrines, the dogmas of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, what they were going to believe, what they could not believe. And if you believe this, you're going to be excommunicated. I was never incommunicated, so how can I be excommunicated, right? But that's what they did. And here's what the Council of Trent one, two, three, four, five, six different um, clauses, canons they call them, directing those who are going to be Catholic what they must believe in order to be able to go to heaven. Canon number one, if anyone shall deny that the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ and therefore entire Christ are truly, really, and substantially contained, really, really, really substantially contained, for real contained, in the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist, and shall say that he is only in it as a sign, or in a figure, or virtually, virtually let him be accursed. That's me. Canon number two, if anyone shall say that the substance of the bread and wine remains in the sacrament of the most holy Eucharist together with the blood and body of our Lord Jesus Christ and shall deny that wonderful and singular conversion of the whole substance of the bread into the body and of the whole substance of the wine into the blood, the outward forms of the bread and wine still remaining which con conversion the Catholic Church must or most aptly calls transubstantiation, 
let him be accursed. That's two against me. Number three. If anyone shall deny that in the venerated sacrament of the Eucharist, the entire Christ is contained in each kind and in each several particle of either kind when separated, let him be accursed. Well, I deny that. Canon number four. If anyone shall say that after consecration, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ is only in the wonderful sacrament of the Eucharist in use whilst it is taken and not therefore before or after and that the true body of the Lord does not remain in the host or particles which have been concentrated and which are reserved or remain after the communion, let him be accursed. In other words, if they have leftover Eucharist pieces, I mean, what do you do? You know, scrape that out and let the dogs eat slop or feed it to the pigs? You can't do that. That's Jesus. That's blasphemy to do that. So they say, if you deny that any of the, even the smallest crumb that falls off the Eucharist after it's been consecrated, if you believe that the smallest crumb can fall off and it no longer contains the divinity and the body of Christ, and you can just discard it however you want to. If you believe that, you're cursed. I believe that. Canon number five. If anyone says that the principal fruit of the most holy Eucharist is the remission of sins or that other effects do not result from it, let him be accursed. That's me. Canon number six. If anyone shall say that Christ the only begotten of Son of God is not to be adored in the Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist, even with the open worship of Latria, and therefore not to be venerated with any particular festival, celebrity, nor to be solemnly carried about in processions according to the praiseworthy and universal rites and customs of the Holy Church, and that he is not to be publicly set before the people to be adored, and that his adorers or idolater, idolaters, let him be accursed." You are idolaters. You are idolaters. You hold up a piece of bread, a cracker, a biscuit, whatever you want to call it, a wheat wafer. You hold that up. And if you don't say that's God, you're accursed. Get out. Well, that's me. So I guess I would never qualify as being a good Catholic because I don't believe any of that garbage. I don't believe any part of it whatsoever. So the Catholic Church, here's what I think the Catholic Church is trying to do. Since Vatican II Council, 1963, actually started, I think, in 1959. Pope John XXIII um, was going to call for um, a, a, a Catholic Cardinal Bishop Conference, call it the Vatican II Conference, where they were going to revise and update the rules, the canons, the dogmas. In other words, they had been doing it the same way for about 15, 1,600 years and all the masses were said in Latin and nobody understood what they were saying. So they said, you know, will it, will it hurt us? Will it kill God if we start saying the mass in English? Things like that. But they recodified their most fundamental and core doctrines. And one of those doctrines is, what is that wafer? Once the priest has blessed it, what is it then? Is it still just a piece of bread? Un, un, um, unleavened? No baking soda in it? Nothing to make it rise up? Is it still consecrated to become the body and blood of Jesus Christ? Or is it still just a wheat 
wafer. And I say, I don't care how many people voted on it and said, that's, a, that's Christ. There's no doubt in my mind, that's Christ. We're all in agreement. That's Christ. I'm telling you according to the scripture. It isn't. Isn't anywhere near Christ. Now, I, um, I used this last week. Sister D in our church, uh, she had a relative pass away. She had her Roman Catholic Bible. She handed it down to D and D loaned it to me because it had all these stuff and articles about the Catholic Church and the explanation of the Mass and how those, those people who attend Mass can understand now what's going on in the service. Okay. And it's an old Bible too. It's coming apart. And I, and I think it predates the Vatican II Council, which ended in 1963. I think it predates that. So some of the things that are in that Bible have changed a little bit, but not much. But here's what that Catholic Bible, their article on the Mass said. And that goes along with what we said last week, the week before last, both Pastor Mike online episodes that we did. And by the way, we will have by next week a total of uh, five lessons now on this subject of the sacrifice of the Mass. If you would like to get copies of those for your family members or friends that you know, then call our office and say, yes, uh, and, and, and here's what we would like to do. Because it'll save us postage. Postage, postage is, is, when it comes to uh, duplicating discs and sending them out, postage is our number one expense. The discs themselves are cheap. We get them about 35 cents a piece. We've got rapid burners, so that doesn't take a long time. We've got two label printers that print the ink right on the disc itself. And so it's, I mean, it's quite a neat process. Please don't, please don't call and put names of family members on our mailing list because you want them to hear our stuff because nine times out of 10, they're going to throw it away. And what's happened is we've just wasted the Lord's resources. We've just wasted his money. So if you want somebody to receive the discs, the DVDs that we send out, we would be better off sending them to you and let you give it to them. Because some of the people that people have called in and say, Hey, I want you to put my uncle Joe on your mailing list. He really needs to see this stuff. Well, uncle Joe called our office last week and cussed us out and threatened to sue us for harassment because he keeps getting these discs. Well, he's not going to win a harassment case. But that's something that my girls have to deal with. Usually every week, some irate person who gets these discs, they never ask for them. So if there's somebody that you know you think would benefit from these, by all means, we would love to send it to them. But make sure that they give their permission to receive them first. Okay? Because it puts us in a bad spot and we feel like we're wasting the Lord's money by having all these things come back to us. I think one month we got 50 packages uh, stamped return to sender. The people didn't want them and they sent them back. And that doesn't count the people that we guessed as soon as they got it, knew what it was, threw them in the trash. Okay. But if you, if you know somebody that could benefit by watching these things, give us a call. Make sure that if we're going to send them to you, and then we'll let you be the one that gives it to them. Because it would be more personal then. 
say, hey, look, I know, you know, you know I'm Baptist, you're Catholic, I still love you, you're my aunt, you're my uncle, my, you're my cousin, I don't want this to come between us. But would you at least listen to one of these and let this guy show you from the Bible the way that you're believing now and how wrong it is. Something like that, let, let God lead you in it, all right? Now, but here's part of this article now on the Catholic Mass from this old Bible. The Mass can be understood only in relationship to the death of Christ on Calvary. The Mass is a memorial of Christ's sacrifice of his life, but it is much more than a memorial. It is a reenactment of that sacrifice. Out of his boundless love for mankind, Christ empowered his apostles and their successors to repeat the unbloody sacrifice he offered at the Last Supper. It was with the words, do this in commemoration of me, that he communicated to them this power. The Mass, then, is a sacrifice, the same as the sacrifice of Calvary. Above every altar at which Mass is celebrated stands a crucifix, a constant reminder that the Mass is Christ's death repeated. Now remember what we started out with. The four things that the Jerusalem Council told all of us Gentiles who were going to be believers in Jesus, what we could and could not do. And there was only four things. Number one, don't commit fornication. Well, that's good. Number two, do not eat food offered to, to another God or offered to an idol, a strange God. The Catholic Mass, by this admission here, when they offer the Eucharist to God, they're doing it in the presence of a statue of a dead person, the dying God. It's a violation of the scripture. Then he said they're not supposed to eat anything strangled. Crucifixion, when they're hanging on their arms and their legs are broken, they're strangling themselves by their own rib cage, and it takes hours to do it. And then, of course, God said, anything with blood in it, you're not supposed to eat it. Don't drink the blood. Don't make blood sausage. Don't do anything like that, because the blood is the life thereof. And yet, here's the Catholic Church. They take the Eucharist, they hold it up in front of that crucifix and say, I'm sacrificing Jesus all over again. You're going to have to die again, Jesus. And they sacrifice it in front of an idol. They eat, if that's really Jesus to them, they eat food that's been strangled. And now they're drinking his blood. And out of the four things that the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 told us not to do, three of them directly violate every part of what the Mass is all about. So, it is a reenactment of his sacrifice. Out of his boundless love for mankind, Christ empowered his apostles and their successors to repeat the unbloody sacrifice at the Last Supper. It was, it was with the words, do this in commemoration of me, that he communicated them to them this power. The Mass then is a sacrifice, the same as the sacrifice of Calvary. And above every altar at which Mass is celebrated stands a crucifix, a constant reminder that the Mass is Christ's death repeated. Now, I brought up this question before. How many times... Seeing that Christ is not only the Son of Man, but He's the Son of God. And He's not just half man, half God. He is fully man and fully God. So how is it then that they can think they can kill God and that by eating God, you become a God. 
It's what they're teaching. That's what they're believing. Above every altar at which the Mass is celebrated stands a crucifix, a constant reminder that the Mass is Christ's death repeated. So here is now, the, they call it the sacrifice of the Mass. And my question is, how many times does Jesus have to die in order to pardon all of our sins? How many times? According to the Catholic Church, practically every time somebody sins, a mass has to be said, a confessional has to be given. You must eat the body, the strangled flesh offered to an idol. You must eat that. You must drink the blood, which God said, don't do that. You have to do that now for every sin you committed. So the question is, how many times does Christ have to die in order for mankind to be sin free? How many times? How many Catholic priests are there in the world? 10,000? 100,000? Quarter of a million? How many of them are there in this, in this world? All of them holding a mass ceremony every day somewhere. So it could realistically be said that Christ is crucified somewhere in the world every day at least a thousand times, if not more. And my question is, how many times does Jesus have to die to take away the sins of the entire world? According to the Catholic Church, he must be re-sacrificed every time you sin. Now, let me share a personal story. When my wife and I were young together and I was working in construction, but my heart was heavy. I knew that I needed to get into the ministry. I'd, I'd already been called to preach, went through Bible college and I got away from all that, went to work. I learned to trade. I think God, and I know God wanted it that way. God had to teach me how to run a house, how to manage a house, how to be the head of a house and to do it well. God had to teach this boy how to grow up and be a man. And he, so he put me in the number one job that I never wanted to work in, and that is construction. And God just has a sense of humor. Guess what, Mike? You're going to work in construction. Thanks, God. Okay. But I was looking at a church. They needed a youth pastor. A Southern Baptist church. And so I knew two of the deacons. They put my name in to be a candidate for youth pastor. We had a meeting. I thought the meeting was going kind of well. But the issue came up, they asked me, Brother Mike, have you been baptized? And I said, well, yeah. Was you baptized by immersion? Yeah. Was you baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? And I said, yeah. Were you baptized in this church or another Southern Baptist church? And I said, no, it was a Free Will Baptist Church, but I said there's not very much difference between Free Will Baptist and Southern Baptist. We believe the exact same thing when it comes to baptism. And they kind of got into a little argument about whether or not they would accept that baptism. The next day I found out, the question was brought to me, Mike, if you were to take this job, would you be willing to be rebaptized? And I went, I'm going to have to think about that. Because, and that bothered me. Because if I did that, who would I be doing it for? My first baptism, I remember it. Even though I was nine years old. 
I remember it. I remember mom being so proud of me. Got a baptismal certificate. And even at the nine, as a nine year old boy, I understood that I had already been saved, but baptism follows and it's me showing to the church and to the world that I've died to the old self and died to this old world and I've been raised again into a new life for Christ. I understood that. Nine years old, I understood that. But because their doctrinal statement said, we only accept baptism of like faith and practice. According to them, that meant that I had to be baptized in their baptistry. And I finally said, take my name off the list as a candidate. Because if I were to be rebaptized, I wouldn't be doing it for God and I wouldn't be doing it for me. I would be doing it to satisfy you. And I just didn't like that idea. So here's the thing. I, how many times does a person have to be baptized? Once. How many times does a person get saved? How many times does Christ die? So Hebrews 10, 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's where we get that term, by the way, once and for all. I'm going to do this once and for all. Well, that phrase came right out of a King James Bible. It's part of our English now. We'll do it once for all. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And if Christ's sacrifice on the cross is not sufficient to save us from all of our sins, then what good is it to begin with? If you've got an old beat up car and the brakes are out on it, the steering's out on it, and the engine doesn't work, so that they put a new steering thing in it and a new brake line in it, those work. And the engine they put in it, you drove it for a week, the engine falls out, you got to go get a new engine. So you go get a new engine. A week later, that engine goes bad. You're going to go get another engine. How many engines are you going to put in this car? I'd have stopped after the first one. And said, this is a piece of junk. I'm not, I want my money back. Christ only died once. He only had to die once. Hebrews 7, 26. For such an high priest became us who is not holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. He doesn't need to die daily. He doesn't need to offer up his sacrifice daily. He did it once and only once. But in, in everything we saw, in two Watchmen broadcasts, two Pastor Mike Online episodes, everything that we've seen, the Catholic Church is telling us that every time they perform a Mass, they are not just remembering the sacrifice of Christ, they're reacting and re-sacrificing Jesus Christ all over again. And that's blasphemy. Hebrews 9.11 but Christ being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. You remember that picture of the tabernacle that we showed you? It's that box where they keep the communion wafers before and after the mass. Now, did those tabernacles, 
were those shipped via FedEx from heaven made by God? Were they made by Santa's elves somewhere? No. They were made with the hands of man. So, Christ being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in, how many times? Once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Christ died for us one time. His blood was shed one time. And it doesn't matter when our sins are committed. Whether they were committed in the past, they're being committed right now, or they're committed in the future. It doesn't matter. Because Christ's blood is everlasting, eternal blood. He's the God-man. He can die one time and save everybody of all of their sins, even the ones they haven't even committed yet. You see, we don't ask new converts when they, would you like to come and, and, you know, ask Jesus in your heart, be saved? Yeah, I think I want that. Hey, Jesus, we need you to die on the cross again for this person. He doesn't have to do that. He's already done it once and never no more. The Catholics will tell you that if you don't believe what, our, what the church tells you about the transubstantiation and the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and the Mass and confession, they say, if you don't believe that, there's a curse on you. And I say, if you believe that Christ has to be re-crucified every time you sin, there's a curse on you. Now, which, who's right here? Is the catechism right? Or is the Bible right? Hebrews 9, verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place, every year with blood of others, for then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is, a, we know this verse, we've used this verse all the time. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. But did you ever look at the context that that's in? The context of that verse absolutely smashes and destroys Catholic doctrine. So let's read that context again. Verse 26, For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. See, it doesn't get any, it doesn't get any plainer than that. So people sin. We sin often. And in the Old Testament days, those poor priests and all those lambs being killed every day for the sins of Israel, Christ came along with a better idea. Instead of you killing your lamb, I'll be the lamb. And I'll let you kill me. And I will be the sacrifice. And then I will take my own blood as an everlasting, eternal record to God the Father in heaven and sprinkle my divine blood on the altar of the Lord in heaven 
so that for a pro, pro, perpetual sign for all eternity, God looks at the blood on the mercy seat and he sees that all of the sins that those people who believed in him, all of those sins that they committed, God has forgiven every one of them. Now, let me help you with something. I got chewed out. I get chewed out a lot by people. Because they, they would rather believe their doctors of theology and their books over the Bible. And I've made it a point to tell people, I believe in order to be saved, you better be ready to do some repenting. For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be sorry for. If God the Holy Spirit bears down on you the weight of your sin and you just can't take it anymore, then God's going to bring you to godly sorrow. He's going to chasten you. You're going to confess those sins and God has already forgiven them. But he does have to chasten us every now and then, doesn't he? It has to be a little, little bit of earth consequences here. And I'd rather have all the earth consequences in the world for the things that I've done wrong than to have that everlasting consequence. You know what I'm saying? I'd much rather it be that way. But just because I still abide in a flesh body and I know this flesh body is going to continue to sin. I would do, if I could have done something about it, I would have done it already. I would have done it before you ever knew about me. But I can't. And yet every time I go back to my father to confess my sins and see the thing is, if I had to go to a priest, do you think I would tell that priest everything? Let me tell you another story. It's a book by Charles Chiniqui, former Roman Catholic priest from Canada, who eventually was saved and came out of the Catholic Church. And he wrote a book called The Priest, the Woman, and the Confessional. I think you can buy it from Chick Publications. And I also think you can get a copy from books.google.com. It may even be since the copyright was in the 1800s, it may even be a free PDF download if you want it. Charles Chiniqui was up in Canada and he knew what was going on with all these priests. See, back in the 1800s, you didn't have so much of the priests going after the little boys. They were going after the girls. And he said, I, we, he said, I knew how it worked. Because if a 12, 13 year old girl, a damsel comes into the confessional, well, it's forbidden that her mother be in there with her. That's against God's rules. She can't be in here. So he gets that girl, maybe not the first day she visits, but after two or three times, he starts getting that girl to open up about all the dirty sins that she's been committing in her mind. Or maybe when she's off by herself somewhere and nobody can see her. And he starts getting that girl to talk lasciviously. And by that time, she is just putty in his hands. That scandal's been going on for a long time. If you can get a copy of it, I encourage you to read it. 
Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. First Peter 3.18 For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now look at Hebrews chapter 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. It's almost like no Catholic theologian ever even bothered to read the Bible. Because most people that read their Bible every day and confess their sins to God and try to live a godly Christian life, most of those people don't have PhDs. Most of those people never even got out of the eighth grade. And yet they know more about God theology, salvation, soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation, eschatology, study of the last time. They know more about the very nature and character of God than the most educated priest or pope that's ever walked this world with a little red dress on. They get it. They understand it. That you cannot... You cannot take Christ, strip him down again, which is what they did. I mean, I, they're, they're, I've never seen a painting of Jesus being bare naked. There's always that, you know, little thing around his, yeah. But when the Bible says they stripped his garments off him, they stripped his garments off him, loincloth and all. And you say, well, that's shameful. Yeah. And you remember the first thing that Adam and Eve recognized when their eyes were open and they knew they had sinned. They went, I'm naked. And they went and hid themselves. Who was around? It wasn't like the beach was full of people. They knew they were naked. And they were hiding. And God asked them, why are you hiding? Because we're naked. God said, who told you you were naked? Then they realized that because they had sinned, God introduced them to the world of shame. I don't know about you, but a lot of people have the naked dream, right? Where you're out somewhere in public and you realize you don't have anything on. Dr. Freud would say, well, that's your mind, you know, it's playing tricks on you. You're, you're relieving, uh, uh, pent up, uh, embarrassments, things like that. You're getting them out of your mind and reconciling and all that stuff. I don't know. That could be true. I've never been out in public in the nude, but I've had the dreams where I've been out in public in the nude. And that's as far as I ever want to go with it. Because immediately they were ashamed. And when they stripped Christ of all of his clothing, he took our shame on him. That should have been us. He took our shame on himself. And he nailed it to his cross. And when he said, It is is finished. He meant exactly what he said. He didn't say, now if we can do this 
six billion more times, then I will have died for everybody's sins. That's not what he said. He only had to die once. And he did. So to think that the Mass, when it is said, crucifies Christ again and brings him to an open shame. First of all, Pope Francis, you're going to have to pay for that. Secondly, all of you cardinals, all you priests, which most, most Catholic priests are cigarette smokers, drunkards, pedophiles, rapists of some kind, or hooked on pornography. Most of them are that way. I got a story to tell you. I have to wait till next week. But according to them, they now have to bring Christ down from heaven again, cast upon him their shame, so that they can keep looking good in the robes while everybody in the, in the congregation is yelling, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him by receiving the mass. It's an anathema, people. It's a curse. And every Roman Catholic, every priest, and every pope is going to give an account for every sin they committed and every time they tried to bring Christ back to an open shame once again. They're going to have to pay for it. I'm glad God called me to the right religion. I am. We're going to finish this up next week. Ask yourself the question, is it even possible that Christ can come down and appear in the wheat wafer? Is it even biblically possible? We'll find that out next week. If you have Catholic friends, if you have Catholic neighbors, if you have Catholic family members, Pray for them. Show them love. Don't show them judgment. Don't be harsh toward them. Don't get into it with them. Show them the love that Christ would show them. If they were standing at the foot of the cross, Christ would look at them and say, Weep not. Thy sins be forgiven thee. I'm doing this for you. So don't cry for me. That's what Jesus would say. Maybe it wouldn't hurt us to say the same thing. So Pastor Mike, I love you. You're the reason why I do what I do. And pray for our Roman Catholic friends all over the world who need to hear this. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.